we are we are about to begin it warm greetings from cns to everyone we welcome you to this very special webinar in the lead up to this year's international women's day 2016 as all of us know gender based inequities are so deeply entrenched in our social and cultural milieu that often we miss them unless we try to recognize how they make it more challenging for girls and the boys for girls sorry and the women to seek health care they sometimes they are often missed totally at the 44th union world conference on lung health in paris in 2013 cns had released two important publications one was a compilation of select personal stories of women and transgender with tb multi drug resistant tb tb hiv co infection those who were living suffering with it and those who had been those who were survivors and another publication was voices from the field need to make tb programs gender sensitive lot more action has happened since then from a range of organizations and networks and there is no doubt that we cannot end tb if we leave women behind in 2008 the then health minister of india mr ramadas had told cns that more than 100000 women are left by their husbands every year due to tb this is how serious the gender based inequities can get tobacco issue is no different it was only when tobacco industry documents were brought in public domain that we learned how to big tobacco industry was specially specially targeting girls and women as their untapped markets today we have senior experts from both the tuberculosis and tobacco fields who will put these issues together under the gender lens before we invite the panelists let me make a few quick announcements all participants are requested to please send us your questions as the panelists are presenting no need to wait just type your questions by using the chat function or raise your virtual hand you will see on your screen during the question and answer session i also request the panelists to please present in time so that we have good time left for question and answers thanks for your cooperation mr ashok ramsuru is a senior celebrated and award winning journalist from south african broadcasting corporation who has kindly consented to moderate the webinar over to you ashok thanks shobha ji greetings from durban south africa south africa has learned lessons early in its fight against aids the country data soon showed the alarming numbers of women especially young girls who were among those new people who were testing positive for hiv hiv and tb are entwined and tb continues to be the largest cause of death for people with hiv tobacco is no different more young people especially young girls are getting hooked onto tobacco use also governments of our countries have committed to achieve sustainable development goals or sdgs by 2030 and one of these goals is to reduce the burden of non communicable diseases or ncds by one third tobacco is the largest and common risk factor for major killers ncds sdgs reinforce commitments of all governments to fully implement the who framework convention on tobacco control sdgs also commit governments to end tb by 2030 we cannot end tb by 2030 unless we stop leaving women behind our panelists will help us understand how can we make progress fast enough to reduce and in preventable epidemics without any further delay let me let me request our first panelist dr soma swaminath and director general of indian council of medical research icmr and secretary of 
Department of Health Research, Government of India, who is a globally acclaimed crusader for TB and other health issues, is now over to Dr. Swami Nathan. Uh, I think Dr. Swami Swami Nathan is not online as yet. So can, can we begin with Dr. Meera Agi? Uh, she is a veteran in tobacco control yeah. from India and globally too. Uh, and she is with the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease, the union. She has also been involved with International Network of Women Against Tobacco. Uh, over to you, Dr. Agi, because we have just got uh, information from Dr. Soumya Swaminathan. She is in a meeting and she will join us uh, very quickly. So now over to Dr. Agi. Uh, what I am going to um, when what I am going to talk about are the policies in tobacco control and how they affect women and what do we need to do really in order to make these policies very effective. <clears throat> so the title of my uh, presentation is Are We Gratified with the Policies Affecting Women's Tobacco Use? I don't know how to go to the next, okay. Um, and my first slide is Why a Gender Specific Tobacco Control Policy? Women cannot be left behind when it comes to tobacco control because they are theoretically half the population. They too use tobacco. They die due to tobacco use. The tobacco industry targets women. And the annual death toll among women will be 2.5 million by 2030. Of these, Dr. Agi, can I interrupt you here? Please share your slide. There must be a function of sharing your slide. A screen because we can't see your slides. You share your screen, please, if possible. Uh, where would that be? You, it will be somewhere. Your screen. Share, share your screen. Share, share your screen. The option of sharing your screen. Mm -hmm. Because it we can hear you very clearly. We can't see your slides. That's it. Otherwise, you can continue. Yeah, because I do. Okay. Show me the screen. Share the screen. Okay, so you can continue, Dr. Ragi, and you can email your slides to, uh, to, to us so that we can share it with the participants later on. Doesn't matter, and you can speak. That is also very important. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, the uh, status of the policies as of present is that these policies are not very effective. The tobacco control policies are not very effective. Every now and then I get this, uh, you know, by itself, and I cannot read my slides. You know, how do I put this off? I don't know. What Something comes on the screen, and I do not know how to put it off. There must be something on your screen to show that. And uh, so I was talking about yeah, that we the can see it now. I beg your pardon? We can see your slides now. Okay. And uh, the status of the policies are that they are not really effective. And also because they are not implemented fully and properly. Now the women leaders who work in tobacco control, they feel that these policies are fractured. They are not specific enough to be relevant to women and they do not pay attention to women's unique needs. We saw that CEDO said it, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women in 1979 required that gender perspective to be integrated into all policies and programs affecting women's health. And women's health have to drive the policies. Involvement of women in the planning, implementation, and evaluation of health policies and programs are needed badly. The Kobe Declaration similarly calls for a halt to the tobacco menace among women and children 
And they say that it includes gender-specific concerns and perspective in each and every aspect of the policy. And it states that tobacco control strategies must integrate the program of gender equality in society. Women of all strata are to drive the health policies, not just the professionals, but women of all strata. Women's leadership is essential to the success of these strategies. And we, I think those who work in tobacco control, they are aware that tobacco use affects women very differently. It doesn't affect them just like it affects men, but it affects them differently. Because the risk among women are unique as well as they are higher. Smoking causally linked to cervical cancer, leading cause of death from cancer among women in low and middle income countries. Smoking Some is. evidence linking active smoking ex and exposure to secondhand smoke in increases breast cancer. And compared with the non smoker, women smokers have 25% greater relative risk of coronary heart disease. Women after pregnancy puts the baby at risk if they continue to smoke. And it results in sudden infant death syndrome, reduced lung function of the child, respiratory illnesses among children, middle ear infections, impaired growth and development, behavioral problems, and women who smoke may produce less breast milk to feed their babies. Now we know that. Uh, these, these uh, tobacco use affects women in a different way. The risks among women are unique as well as higher, I have said. And smoking after pregnancy also, I have talked about how it puts the child at risk. Sensory aspects are far more important for women addicted to smoking than men. You know, they, they are much more addicted to the feel of the cigarette, the feel of the good car and how it looks and and you know how, how other people are using it. Addiction is much more severe among women. Nicotine replacement therapy is less effective for women than for men and also these the withdrawal symptoms are much more intense among women than among men. So what do we so what do we do? What is the alert on policy making? And if we have to make policies, we have to regularly monitor exposure of women to smoke, to secondhand smoke in homes and in public places and workplaces. And we have to always include gender and diversity based analyses we have to do. And we have also to evaluation of all that control with us. We have to develop guidelines for gender impact assessment procedures in evaluate the various tobacco control measures. For example, the tax increase measure on cigarette about which we make a big deal, we always talk about that the, if you increase the tax and if the price of the cigarette is increased, it will affect the users. They, you know, they will reduce or the even the prevalence will go down. But we do not know how the tax affects women. We have never, uh, we have never done any analysis on women. We have not assessed how women who use tobacco are being affected by the, by the increase in prices. Do they continue to smoke or do they give it up? Are they quitting at the same rate as men? If male tobacco users, if male tobacco users not quitting, what is the impact on women? It happens that suppose her husband is smoking and the price of the cigarette goes up. And uh, the but this husband still doesn't give it up. And what is the impact on women's household budget, nutrition, education, and health, etc. Finally, I feel that uh, I cannot help but say that ironic that tobacco industry takes all care to meticulously and carefully devise these strategies to get women to initiate and start using tobacco products. However, in stark contrast, our policies, including WHO, FCTC, almost are quiet on this. FCTC must review its resolve 
at a conference of the party seven, which is going to be held in India, and the FCTC should take it as a clarion call and amend its ways of taking care of women in, in the making of their policies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raghi. Uh, and I think Dr. Soumya Swaminathan is online. So we welcome Dr. Soumya Swaminathan. She needs no introduction. As uh, uh, Ashok Ramsarup had pointed out earlier, she is Director General of Indian Council of Medical Research, ICMR, and Secretary of Department of Health Research, Government of India. And she is a globally acclaimed crusader for TB and other health issues. Over to you. Dr. Swaminathan, and thank you once again for finding time to be on this webinar. You're welcome. Uh, actually, I was thinking that I can answer uh, uh, questions. I don't have a presentation. Uh, okay, uh, but if, if you would like to say something in connection with uh, a TB in women, we would love to hear you say something because you... Yeah, so... TB in men and yes. children, I say a little bit. Yes. yes. Your expert in comments. Terms of on, TB? In terms of TB and yeah. women per se, yes. Because this is, webinar is in the lead up to uh, International Women's Day. You can include children there also. Right. I think it's quite linked. And, uh, yes, yes, TB, yes. TB in, biologically speaking, women have less of TB than men a reason we don't know the rates of TB in men especially in the adult age group are much higher than in women but post menopausal women are at higher risk and children in children the difference between boys and girls is uh, is not there so it's only during the reproductive age group probably some hormonal influence is there so that is something very unusual but having said that the TB is one of the leading causes of maternal mortality and death in you know, young women, and particularly in countries where there's a lot of HIV infection, uh, it's been seen that uh, a lot of the mortality, even related to pregnancy and childbirth, can actually be uh, attributed to tuberculosis, usually undiagnosed. And not only that, studies have shown that women who have HIV and TB during pregnancy have poor maternal as well as pediatric outcomes. So the children are uh, who are born are affected in terms of lower birth weight, higher infant mortality, and the women also have higher rates of uh, maternal mortality and, and more of uh, hemorrhage. So tuberculosis does affect women, especially during their reproductive years. Um, another way in which TB affects women is uh, perhaps TB of the genitourinary tract, which leads to, in many cases, infertility and gynecological problems as well as uh, menstrual problems and this is also very difficult to diagnose and detect. There's probably quite a bit of underdiagnosis as well as overdiagnosis going on and uh, this is again a, a specifically uh, a problem where TB specifically affects, affects women. The other aspect apart from the biomedical aspect of TB is of course the social aspects and economic aspects where women probably suffer uh, disproportionately. If uh, the man of the house gets TB, certainly it's the, it's the caregiver and she has to take up the burden of looking after the children as well as earning a living and providing care for the man. At the same time if the woman of the house gets TB then very often you see that uh, she doesn't get that kind of support from the family. There's still a fair amount of stigma around TB in our society. And uh, so there are many situations where the woman is either asked to leave the home or is discriminated and they themselves have a lot of self-perceived stigma in addition to the actual stigma that they experience where they keep away from social functions, they keep away from get-togethers, because they, they don't want to talk about the fact that they have TB. Economically also, there's, there have been some studies to show that TB drives people into poverty. Um, the expenditure, out-of-pocket expenditure leading up to diagnosis and treatment is uh, very often more than the, the monthly income of these families. And uh, here again, you know, women do suffer disproportionately 
are the ones who have to actually keep the home uh, going and look after the children and so on. So there are uh, many aspects of TB which perhaps are unique uh, to women and these uh, aspects have not necessarily been, uh, been well studied. I mean there was one large study that was funded by TDR many years ago where in four countries, I think it was India, Bangladesh and two African countries, the multicentric study where, which looked at the impact of TB, especially looking at stigma, looking at um, various aspects of the of the disease on women specifically from a gender lens and that those study series of studies were published and showed that pretty much in all the countries there was uh, quite an impact on women. Surprisingly though one thing that has not been found to be different is the health seeking behavior. I mean one would think that perhaps TB diagnosis happens later in women than in men but uh, several studies in India have shown this is not the case. In fact women seem to seek care even earlier than men. So there's no delay on the part of women in terms of uh, actually approaching the health system and if at all there are delays in diagnosis it's the cause of the health system itself. Similarly women have been shown to be more compliant than men in taking treatment so once they start a course of treatment they're generally more regular and so their outcomes are good. In terms of the impact of uh, TB on children, this, though that's not the theme for today, but certainly when the woman of the house has TB and either dies or suffers from chronic ill health, the children do suffer in terms of care and uh, in terms of support. So that is one indirect way, but then it's also possible that infection spreads more rapidly from the woman of the house to her children, and if a mother has TB, and she has young children in the household, then those children are likely to get infected and some of them are likely to actually develop active TB disease and therefore the active household screening, contact screening and so on becomes very important in this, uh, in this situation. And we've seen that this is not only true for young women but older women as well, grandmothers who are looking after grandchildren in the household are often the ones who uh, would have passed on the infection. So I think I'll just stop there and then we can uh, take up any discussion that comes up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan. Uh, we now open it for question and answers. Uh, as I had requested earlier, participants can either use the chat function or raise the virtual hand for asking questions. We already have quite a few questions. Uh, so, um, uh, I think uh, Sumita Thapar wants to ask a question. Sumita, would you like to ask it yourself? Sumita? Uh, Sumita wants to know uh, a little bit more about link between smoking and cervical cancer, if any. I think Dr. Ambu should be able to answer that. Or the link we are found between smoking and cervical cancer. I mean, I'm not a I'm I'm not a medical doctor to answer that question, but you know. Uh, you know, the scientific reports have told us that uh, uh, women who smoke uh, have got, you know, uh, I mean, they, uh, they have got more probability of having the cervical cancer. Oh, uh, another question for you, Dr. Raghi, from Richa Sharma. She wants mm -hmm. to know how do, how do we monitor exposure to secondhand smoke of women, especially inside the homes? Can you please well, elaborate? practicality of any solution? Some, some scientific studies have been done, uh, uh, you know, beyond what they have done is they have taken uh, the hair sample from the women, uh, from, the, from the root of the hair, they took samples and from there they, they do the analysis and they determine how much uh, nicotine has been uh, deposited on those hair and this is how they find out, uh, you know, 
uh, and then of course uh, in in terms of you know how women suffer um, in terms of uh, getting all kinds of diseases and all kinds of problems starting with cough and everything you know so uh, this is how they can tell whether the woman has been uh, affected by the second hand smoke at home or not when she starts getting all the problems that a smoker gets because uh, a person who is in a um, who is exposed to second hand smoke uh, has all the they have the probability of getting all the troubles that a that a smoker can get uh, thank you. We have a question for Dr. Soumya Saminathan. Uh, uh, doctor, you had mentioned uh, about genital TB and uh, that is a big problem and why is genital TB so difficult to diagnose? In fact, uh, we at CNS had done a new story a year or so ago when ICMR was doing a multicentric study to develop a diagnostic algorithm for genital TB. Uh, any updates on that? And why is it so difficult to diagnose? Hello, is Dr. Soumya Swaminathan there? Dr. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you now, yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, well, it's difficult to diagnose because uh, what you see usually is the result of an earlier TB infection. And when you try and do diagnostic tests, you may or may not find any evidence of TB. And secondly, you have to do a lot of uh, invasive tests. You have to do laparoscopy and biopsy and uh, all sorts of other investigations, which are often not possible. So what happens is that somebody makes a clinical diagnosis most of the time. And that's why I said that there's probably a lot of over-diagnosis of this. Anybody with infertility, the gynecologist just says this might be TB, let's give anti-TB treatment. So it's really not an evidence-based. So the multicentric study that ICMR was doing, I think the final results are not out yet. But what I know is that there was very low rates of TB that they found, despite using culture and all you know sensitive tests to diagnose it. Very few cases in which TB was actually uh, confirmed, maybe 4 or 5 percent only of the infertility cases. So that just means that uh, you know, both the things. One is that possibly what we are seeing is the burnt out cases sequelae, which have already left its mark, and there's no active uh, bacteria in the lesion. Second possibility is that they, they are not TB at all, the infertility is due to other reasons. Thank you. Dr. Swamya, as, we have see, as you have said also, and we all see, that it, uh, TB impacts women in a, in, a very, in, my, in a much more negative way than men. But still, in most of the TB conferences and the recent NATCON, 70th NATCON, which was held in uh, Lucknow recently, we see few women experts on TB, much fewer than men. You are a champion of this cause. How do we bridge this divide? And the divide uh, exists right up to the ground level where most of the dot providers are men. And sometimes that also acts as a deterrent for women to seek treatment. What do you have to say to this? That's interesting. I, I don't know the, the data on the DOTS provider. Um, so I'm quite surprised that there are more men than women. And in terms of doctors, um, yeah, I think there aren't too many people who've taken up TB as a specialization. You know, most people specialize to respiratory diseases or in infectious diseases. And so TB as a specialty for some reason has not been popular at all. And therefore you find, especially in tuberculosis research, of course there are very few, but even like you mentioned TB doctors, probably there aren't too many uh, clinicians who are into TB. And <laughs> again, I don't know the reason for this. I think we again need to do more advocacy. Um, there are a lot of gynecologists who are interested in TB. Many of them are women. There are a lot of pathologists and microbiologists who work on TB, but fewer clinicians. 
and uh, so maybe we have to uh, inspire the next generation so that we can change that a little bit. Okay, a, a, a participant from uh, from Bangalore uh, wants to know that can uh, women who are cured of TB, especially women, of course it applies to others also, be appointed community workers and peer counselors by government to help reduce stigma and improve treatment outcomes, as has been happening perhaps in the field of uh, HIV. Uh, Will, will that help in reducing stigma? Particularly, I think, if we have women uh, cured of TB as peer counselors. Yes, I think that's a very good idea. I think there are places where this is happening, where uh, treated TB patients are, uh, you know, volunteer their services as dot providers. And it should be encouraged even more. I totally agree. Perhaps we should, again, do more advocacy around this, like, HIV community is well organized. The problem with TB is you don't have a community. Once people are treated, they're cured, they, they, that's it, they're back to their lives. They don't continue to identify themselves as TB patients or continue to do work the way the HIV community does. And that's something I think civil society needs to get engaged in. Thank you. Uh, I would again ask the participants to please send in your questions through chat function or raise the virtual hand if you want to ask something. Uh, we have Dorcas from Kenya. Uh, would you like to share your comment, Dorcas? You have some comment to make and also a question. Would you like to ask that? Yes. Hello? Yes, yes hello. We can hear you. Yes, Dorcas. Okay. I was asking the uh, Angie. Uh, my name is Dr. Kitu. I work for the Ministry of Health of Kenya and also I'm the Bureau Member for the Africa Region and the FCTC and I'm glad that we will have the FCTC COP7 in uh, India. And I think this is a very important topic and I was seeking the indulgence of uh, Dr. Angie if she can probably have a side meeting during the COP on uh, tobacco and, and women to raise the, uh, the priority of this agenda because I think uh, in the tobacco control arena the gender issues have not really come out uh, strongly particularly targeting women in regard to protection of women, uh, protection of the rights of women to health, to smoke free environments, to education and also to healthy nutrition based on the uh, expenditure of the household uh, budget on tobacco consumption and uh, mm -hmm. sustaining the tobacco addiction. So I think I was just uh, highlighting those questions to Dr. Aki. I think you very much. This is a very good suggestion and uh, to tell you the, to tell you really because we were, there was, a, there is a plan to have a lunchtime seminar on gender and uh, and um, and tobacco. Yes, there would be a seminar. Mm -hmm. I mean, the proposal is already there, so the secretariat has to accept it now. Ah, thank you very much. I'm glad to note that, and uh, I hope we can also develop a strategy to implement the same because uh, I think women all over the world, especially in developing countries, experience similar. Uh, challenges and the uh, unique circumstances that uh, women have in regard to exposure to tobacco smoke and also to a diversion of uh, resources that should be available to them for household uh, use for addiction, uh, sustaining of the tobacco addiction by their spouses. Yes, I think this suggestion is very, very taken because it's very easy to say this, talk about the status of uh, women suffering from different uh, aspects of tobacco control, but I think that it's very important to give a solution to the problem, you know, how it can be, you know, amended. And I think that in the seminar, we are hoping that it will be done. Ashok Ram Surup wanted to ask a question. Ashok Ram Surup. Yes, can you hear me now, Ji? Yes, we Hello. can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. A lovely, great stuff. Yeah, smoking seems to be a very serious problem around the world. 
But one of the serious, one of the most important, or rather, an important question being asked is the impact of uh, indoor smoking. Now, I'm sure every household, or most households today, there are some smokers, obviously, you know, causing a whole, whole lot of uh, health problems, to, especially to the young. How can we try and bring about educational patterns to our to to, to families? I think that did, did there, is a, there is sorry, there is a, uh, now the uh, uh, discussion going on that uh, you know the uh, that is so very important to make rules and regulation for the home. You know, right now none of the tobacco legislation has any control over what is happening in the house, you know, in, indoors what is happening. The suggestions are made but it's not uh, implemented. However, there are, uh, there is a possibility that, uh, you know, when, uh, when, when the men smoke at home, uh, the women really suffer. So it can come under uh, women battering, child battering and stuff like that. But also, you know, the domestic help is at home. So people are trying to approach from that point of view that nobody can smoke at home because there are there are people you know who come to work at home and they are suffering and so there can be uh, litigation uh, um, you know from this point of view. But uh, on the uh, but more than that, I think that it is important that th that there be a education you know uh, um, you know imparted to the to men as well as women that it's very harmful to be smoking at home because the women are uh, the women and the children are suffering due to that you know but okay. it is not included in any legislation there are no legislations for that you know. so do you feel the lawmakers can do something about this around the world yeah. Well, I, I think that that's what I was saying, that it can be approached from the point of view of, uh, you know, subjecting women to some, some kind of, uh, as you know, it could be considered a crime or what, I don't know. But uh, something like that, uh, subjecting women to, uh, to this terrible, uh, terrible source of disease, you know, it's like battering. Correct. Uh, you know, Correct. Sure, no, I, so I, I, I that, totally agree that with that. From that point of view, there can be some, some kind of legislation, you know, but uh, especially if the women raise their voice or the domestic help at home raise their voice, certainly there can be, uh, you know, it can, it can go to the court. Uh, also, do you feel by raising taxes that will help in some way? Well, we, we, I think that we all know that uh, raising taxes by itself doesn't do anything there. Has, I mean, the, it does a lot. It does a lot, but I think it is more effective when other things are in place, when the other uh, uh, parts of the provision of a legislation are in place. The, uh, you know, the price going up also helps. But, uh, you know, people who are very addicted, they won't give it up that easily. And also, especially if there are no, uh, if there, there are no arrangements in a, in a place where there is cessation available for people, there is education available for people. And there are many places in the low-income and middle-income countries where cessation, I mean, even in my country, cessation is, is it at a very infant stage. We do not... We have a, a very robust legislation and we, we have very strong provisions in the law, but then people, if people want to give it up, you know, very little help is available, you know. Sure. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. And now, uh, I think Dr. Soumya Swaminathan has had to leave for another meeting. So any questions for Dr. Soumya Swaminathan can be sent by participants by email and we will try to, you can email the questions to her or to us <clears throat> and we will try to get the responses for them. Meanwhile, I request the participants to ask more questions of Dr. Meera Agi. We are fortunate to have her with us today. Uh, I think uh, uh, 
Saroja Uthran wanted to ask a question. Saroja, would you like to ask some question? <coughs> yes, Saroja. Uh, okay, as we wait for Saroja, Nenet uh, from Philippines wanted to ask a question. Nenet, are you there? Hello, Nenet. Nenet's question is, what could be the role of CSOs especially women for integrating anti-smoking strategies into TBHIV programs and is there a common research agenda focused on women and young girls and are there any health and development strategies focused on elderly women most of the time we are talking of young girls and women even in case of tobacco cessation do the elderly women need a special uh, uh, agenda, special policy? Certainly, uh, certainly, because you know, the, usually when, when we talk to older women, they say that, uh, you know, there is no need for us to give up, give up the use of tobacco, whether it is chewing tobacco, smoking tobacco, because we are old already and the damage has been done. And so nothing can be done. So why should we give up the use of tobacco? And it's very important to explain to them that no matter when it does benefit the uh, benefit the person when he gives up the use of tobacco, whether it is uh, the earlier the better. But if they have waited for so long, even then it, it helps really to you know it it prolongs your uh, life. It uh, prolongs your uh, it, uh, it improves your health if you give up uh, tobacco. But I do not know any programs which are specifically for older women, you know. I don't think there are any, uh, you know, around the world. I've never heard of any specific uh, cessation programs for older women, you know. On the whole, it is... Uh, it is very, uh, it's, it's a matter of concern that, you know, when it comes to women, you know, uh, uh, we are second-hand citizens because, you know, any, any program which are, which have to be devised, you know, usually the men are consulted. And even if the women are consulted, when the strategies are made, that they are forgotten completely. The strategies are all based on, on men. So that is why they are not effective. They are not at all effective, you know. Uh, uh, Dr. Raghi, I want to ask a question. Uh, the, mm -hmm. In India, the smoking of beedies in rural women has been quite a norm for decades. And in the urban areas, there is cigarette smoking among women that has risen, but uh, sometimes uh, socially they are looked down upon. More women are smoking beedies in the rural areas. Uh, can you elaborate more on this urban-rural divide? Well, the thing is that uh, you know the women in in the in the rural areas they are more uh, you know they they take up to the smoking of the babies just watching the peer group and you know uh, many times women are advised to take up uh, smoking for example in Kerala if you have a toothache you know usually you are advised why don't you start chewing tobacco you know because it uh, uh, you know it will it will help you to bear your pain or whatever it is. Uh, so I think it is uh, it is important to remember that uh, you know there are too many misconceptions and you know wrong perceptions uh, of things and women uh, in 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 the rural areas uh, you know have no have no idea that smoking is bad for them because we haven't done anything to educate the women that they you know women in the villages. To some extent, uh, you know, there are there is, there is some exposure in the rural urban areas, but in the rural areas, 
it's very it's it's almost nil you know so those women they take up the habit uh, you know watching other women being advised by other women and or uh, uh, it's a it's a social thing you know mixing with one another and they start smoking beads and uh, you know and they they start with the beads and they end with the beads they die with smoking beads yeah but it, uh, it's very difficult for them to realize that beads are bad for them now on the other hand cigarette smoking you know because i i think that uh, in the, there was a stigma uh, attached to smoking among uh, women in the urban areas but no more no more that stigma is there because you know the the tobacco companies they have taken enough pain to really publicize uh, you know smoking and in tobacco among women because they know that uh, they have been driven out from the from the first world so they come to the uh, to the uh, to the low income and the middle income countries and there they publicize for women and women want to be like the women in the west they want to look cool they want to uh, look confident and so on and so forth so this divide is there because it's based on the tobacco industry and it is based on the fact that there is no program in in at least in my countries in general to you know to educate the women in the rural areas that uh, smoking weed is bad for them you know in fact you know uh, just a few months back i i was working with a, a group of men um, you who, who work in construction sites and those men you know they have no idea that uh, smoking weed is bad for them you know they said that they have they have read about warning on the beauties that is it bad for them it will kill them and all that but they don't believe in them you know so even if you tell them because even just writing uh, on the on the pack of beauty or on the pack of spirit is not going to help anybody to understand how it is bad and why it is bad you know there has to be an elaborate education program in order to educate the people you know how uh, how it really is bad for them okay thank you so so what's the way forward we need more awareness uh, programs at the ground level in involving actually i i won't see awareness program because awareness is a very very cheap looking word because that is the awareness we were talking about writing on the pack of cigarette or in the pack of beads there has to be education there has to be information given to people in such a way that it be, they inculcate it you know they internalize it and they understand it what happens you know when uh, day in and day out they smoke beads or they smoke cigarette or they chew tobacco what happens to them you know they have to understand that you know so there has to be a step wise education for people you know and very often it has to be uh, you know it has to be in an intensive setup that uh, you know in a community setup or in a one to one kind of setup or in the classroom Uh, you know in schools and colleges everywhere and i i think that the education has to has to start not just with the uh, with the media or anything everybody has to take the responsibility the parents have to educate their children the, the big brothers and sisters have to educate their younger brothers and sisters the teachers have to advise the people at work you know those responsible the managers have to advise so there has to be it has to be from all directions you know and uh, uh, till it comes it's it's not going to help very much you know because there are uh, you are getting two kinds of uh, stimuli you know if somebody just tells you that smoking will kill you but then you have such glamorous scenes of smoking you know the advertisements and everything and you see that uh, you know that uh, people look very smart or uh, you know they say that uh, they say that they enjoy life so much they are so confident and all that and so this this vision of you know the created by the tobacco industry people are much more affected by that than by just being uh, told as, as a as a writing on the cigarette that it is bad for you or it will kill you you know so i won't say that you have to 
have a program of awareness in the sense that you know just write it on a pack of cigarette or something. It has to. This education has to has to start from everywhere. Everywhere people should get these signals that it is not good for them. Then only it will make make an impact. Thank you. Uh, Rosemary Morgan from John Hopkins University wants to ask a question. Uh, Rosemary, are you there? Yes, Is sorry, sorry, I'm here. <laughs> um, my question was around the role of the private sector. You talked a lot about uh, messaging um, it to, coming from the, 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 private sec the private sector, the tobacco industry. And I was wondering what you see is their role um, in preventing tobacco smoking in one, among women and what their obligation is. Oh, the tobacco industry? Yes. Oh, the tobacco industry, I won't trust them. Even if they want to teach, I won't trust them, you know. I don't think that we want to talk about that at all. They are not our partners in education, you know. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? I would request the participants to please send their questions, as I said earlier, through the chat function or by raising the virtual hand, which you see on your screen. So we'll just wait for a while as participants send in more questions. Sure. Uh, doctor, sorry, Doctor, I've got a question actually. Yes. Can you hear me, Doctor? Yes. Doctor, uh, you know, I know for, I do know for a fact that the Indian government has uh, has banned smoking, especially on 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 on, 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 the, on the movie screens. Into this, I don't think I can hear you. There was a lot of disturbance. Are the film directors that? Okay, doctor, can you hear me now? No, I can hear doctor. you, but I think there was a lot of uh, disturbance in, in uh, there was a, you know, a lot of mixing of sounds. Okay. You can ask again. Uh, can, uh, let me, let me yes, ask again. Refill. Yes, can I, can I, refill? I do know for a fact that the Indian government has banned smoking on, on Bollywood movies. Are yes. the producers, film producers, adhering to this? Oh, because I do very understand that some of the movies that coming out are out of that there are some movies that coming out of India, or the movies that leaving India still got, you know, smoking and all that kind of stuff. Is anyone no. checking on that? No, there is a there is a big uh, there is a ban on smoking in movies, and we also we also have got. Uh, you know, media bites which tells people that you know uh, when a when a movie is being shown uh, and there is a uh, there is a smoking scene or something, there is a advisory you know to to nullify that. No, we really have uh, rules for uh, uh, not uh, in, uh, putting smoking in movies. Do you have international rules on movies that coming out of India? Um, international rules in the sense that I think uh, Stanford, I mean uh, the University of California, uh, you know, San Francisco has recommended that it be given uh, um, adult uh, kind of certificate if there is uh, any. They have recommended that, but I I don't know. It, it it's not it's not that kind of um, uh, thing that we are doing in India. Giving an adult, um, we we just don't want uh, smoking in the movies. Uh, thank you. I think Saroja wanted to thank ask you, a doctor. question. Uh, Saroja, are you there? If Saroja is still there, she wanted to ask a question. Mm -hmm. Just wait, so, please. Perhaps she's finding it difficult to connect. Uh, uh, any more questions coming? We'll just wait for one minute more. We are coming to the end of our webinar time also, but we'll just wait for a while if more questions are coming in. Okay. 
Uh, Dorcas wants to ask uh, another question, I think. Dorcas, please ask your question. One. Uh, I think there is also another aspect of a big threat of the increasing uptake of tobacco consumption by women and also emerging new products that are manufactured to target uh, easy consumption or uh, targeting uh, possible uh, or ease of consumption by women. And uh, in our setting, we also see a crop of uh, young women who are now uh, the decision makers and uh, in the household and also decide the budget, how the budget is spent. It can take this in two ways. One, when they are pushing, when they are the ones who contribute or they influence their gender or budget at household level. Maybe they can also facilitate the quitting by men to be able to provide for the household. And also, secondly, the, these women become role models in the household and influence the choices children yes. make and also influence the thought of children on the yes. uptake of tobacco consumption. And I think, finally, to empower women yes. uh, is very important so that they can claim a smoke-free space, not only for themselves, but also for the children in the household and the other workers in the household. And I think we can take advantage of women being voters Nowadays, women in uh, developing countries are also uh, allowed to vote and they can influence the choice of leaders by uh, requiring that they support the inter projects or the interventions that are uh, promote the welfare of women, for example, through smoke-free environments and tobacco control uh, f uh, interventions like taxation and the rest. Thank you very much. Yes, I think women uh, stand to con in every field, uh, I mean, every aspect of tobacco control, I think that, you know, the more and more we involve women in making decisions for policies and in, uh, in, in how day-to-day -day things are done, I think it will make a great uh, difference, you know, because uh, uh, women have their own viewpoint and they have their own experience when they, when they use tobacco or when they are exposed to tobacco, they have got their own opinion and they have got their own suffering to contribute, you know, to speak of. So they, they have a lot to contribute, but the problem is that, you know, uh, there should be a lot to contribute, you know. The problem comes that, you know, everybody feels that, you know, women, uh, um, if we are talking about banning smoking in public places, it's the same for men as for women, but they they don't realize that you have to ask them and what they what what do they understand by that no smoking why why there is no smoking you know so the rationale has to be really understood behind all the policies and behind whatever you know whatever we are doing in our countries you know whether it is the NGOs or the government or whoever is doing this the rationale has to be explained to people why it is being done. And the women have to be asked what they think about that. So I think if women can take the uh, role of leadership and can make uh, you know, decisions about what is going to happen in the house, I'm sure it will make a difference. But it is a long way to go. You know, the stage has not come when <laughs> you know, women are the masters of the house. Uh. We have uh, Kruti Krishan Gupta asking a question, uh, Miraji, that actors like uh, uh, actors like Ajay Devgan still promote pan masala, uh, yeah, and I'm, I think we need to educate our actors and people who influence the youngsters and society. It's it's horrible. It's simply horrible. We are ashamed of that that we have not been able to stop that. You know, from Delhi, uh, we have written uh, letters to all the actors who keep on chewing, uh, you know, pan masala on the TV, and uh, you know, they so, so many of them have been served notices and stuff like that. And you know, nothing much has taken place except for a, for a woman who was doing that, and she said that she is not going to do it. But we don't have, you know, many people are still continuing to do that. You know. Because so I mean, this is the power of the tobacco industry, you know. We have nothing to offer these people, but they have a lot to give to these people, you know. And these people have to understand, 
you know, that it is not good for them. I think the best strategy, for, if I were to talk to them, the, the best strategy would be that they are promoting uh, this pan masala and all that for their own children. What would happen if their children take it up, you know, and become sick? But uh, I do take it, uh, take this criticism, and I am ashamed about that. I'm embarrassed that many of our actors, many of our actresses, uh, still continue to uh, advertise the pan masala. Because you know the the con misconception is that pan masala has nothing nothing uh, uh, bad in it in terms of tobacco, but a nut is equally bad. It's also carcinogenic, you know. And uh, also we are not very sure. We don't have so many uh, so many places to test all the pan masalas, and we are not very sure whether you know it uh, has any tobacco any tobacco at all or not. They, they do say that it is the tobacco is not there, but the areca nut is there, which is equally bad for, for you. So this I criticism, I, I accept it, I'm, I'm embarrassed, but we still have not been able to do very much about it. Okay, with this we come to the end of today's webinar. It has given us, I am sure it has given all of us enough food for thought. And I thank all the participants. I thank our excellent moderator, Ashok Ram Sarup, and above all, our two such well-informed panelists. We were truly honored to have them today. Uh, we will be sending the recording of this webinar to all the participants very soon, as we have been doing it in the past. Thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you.